Hello, this is Jack Jackson. In this video, we're going to talk about some medieval European mathematicians. You see a few of them pictured here in artist renderings. This is uh, a couple of uh, Jewish scholars and mathematicians. Rabbi Ben Ezra is here. And Levi Ben Gerson is here with his uh, Jacob staff that he used for navigation. A couple of Christian mathematicians. There's Nicole Oresmi and Roger Bacon there. Here's a list of a few of the mathematicians from Europe in this period. Uh, Adelard of Bath from 1075 to 1160, England. He translated Arabic and Greek works to Latin, one of the first to really do a lot of that. Uh, Rabbi Abraham ben Meir ibn Ezra from 1090 to 1167, lived in Spain. He translated Arabic works, and he also did some works of his own in combinatorics. Gerhard of Cremona, Cremona from 1114 to 1187. He was an Italian, but he lived and worked in Spain. Translated many Arabic and Greek works to Latin. You notice that Spain became a center for transmission of works uh, that were Greek and Arabic uh, language that translated to Latin eventually. Robert Grosteste, let's see how you pronounce that, Grosteste, from 1168 to 1253, lived in England. He did some work in geometry, optics, astronomy, and he was also a translator. And he felt, helped found empiricism in Western science. So empiricism means uh, that they were talking about actually doing experiments and using experiments and data to uh, to back up your science and to make up your uh, ex explanations of how the world works. Uh, Roger Bacon from 1214 to 1292 in England did work in optics and he also was one that really helped push forward this idea of empiricism in Western science. Uh, Jordan Nemerarius uh, from 1225 to 1260 in Germany. He did arithmetic, algebra, geometry, astronomy, and he was one of the first to use letters for variables. I remember before this, they're all equations and so forth are all written out in words. So there's a start to, uh, to do some sort of abbreviations that eventually, uh, at a later time, led to some of our more modern notations. Levi Ben Gerson, 1288 to 1344, a French Jewish scholar. He did some work with proofs by induction. He did some trigonometry, philosophy, arithmetic, number theory. He did some work on the parallel postulate. Did some work in astronomy where he questioned uh, Ptolemy's model and, and insisted the model must agree with measurements. And he felt like Ptolemy's model really didn't as they took more measurements. And he created the Jacob staff, which we kind of saw pictured earlier. William of Ockham from 1288 to 1348 in England. He's most fam famous for something called Occam's Razor, which said if you're going to make a model of something and uh, go with the simplest model that you can. If there's a, if there's a complicated model and a, simplified mo a simple model, use the simple model. There's a group called the Oxford Calculators, most significantly Thomas Bradwardine from 1295 to 1349, his contemporaries, William Hadesbury, Richard Swineshead, uh, John Dumbleton, and they all worked at Oxford together, and they worked in kinematics. They came up with the mean speed theorem. They questioned Aristotle's ideas of motion. And really, remember that Aristotle's ideas, uh, until this, you know, all the way from, you know, the time of Aristotle until, you know, here in the 13th century, uh, was pretty much unquestioned. And, uh, you know, Aristotle was great, but he also made some mistakes that, uh, that persisted for way too long. Uh, and so they were able to start questioning him a little bit, which starts to uh, open the door for, you know, questions about, uh, when you start questioning Aristotle, you can start questioning everything, these ideas about putting some, uh, making observations and basing things on those was a big deal. And that kind of set the stage a little bit for the Renaissance. 
Nicole Oresme from 1323 to 1382 in France did some work. He was the first one to do exponential, uh, I mean fractional exponents. He did coordinate geometry long before Descartes did, who it's usually named after. And he did some work on infinite series. And if you notice, I skipped one. Uh, the one I skipped was Leonardo de Pisa, also known as Fibonacci, from 1170 to 1250. And he was the most prominent European mathematician of the Middle Ages. And we're going to talk some more about him specifically on the next slide. So once again, he wrote from about 1170 to 1250 uh, in Pisa, Italy. He was probably born there. He's gone, gone by a few other names. Leonardo would have been his, his actual name. De Pisa means he's from Pisa or, or Pisano would have been that. He sometimes he called himself Bigolo, which basically means a traveler. Uh, and he did spend a lot of time traveling. He was educated in North Africa. Uh, his, I guess his family traveled around a lot, and then he traveled around a lot on his own, uh, quite a, over a wide area in there. And from there, he got exposed to many things, including uh, a lot of Islamic ideas, particularly the Hindu Arabic numeration system. And I said he was the uh, greatest mathematician actually of his time, probably even greater than the other um, Islamic mathematicians of his time, even though in general Europe was behind. Uh, the Islamic region at this time. He returned to Pisa permanently around 1200, and so the last 50 years of his life uh, lived and worked there, although I'm not saying he didn't travel any more, but it's basically was stationed there, lived there. There are at least four major works that uh, we have of his. Liberabaki, or the Book of Calculation from 1202, Practica Geometry, 1220, Floss, 1225, and Libra Quadratorum, the Book of Squares from 1225, and there's some more that have been lost. There's an artist's rendering of Leonardo, most commonly just known as uh, Fibonacci. And by the way, Fibonacci means uh, of the house of the family of Bonacci, so he was from the Bonacci family. Let's talk a little bit about each one of his works. By far the most famous and the, ultimately the most influential was Liber Abaki. Basically it means the book of calculation. It ultimately turned out to be a major influence in the spread of Hindu Arabic numerals and of computation using them to Europe. It didn't necessarily take off just right away. Uh, and in fact, Arabic numerals had been um, introduced earlier in Spain. But it took a while for people to uh, not use uh, Roman numerals and, and Greek numerals. So they're using Roman numerals, but they use calculations like uh, uh, an abac abacus we used. And uh, there were actually uh, some competitions between who could work problems faster. Somebody using an abacus and Roman numerals or someone doing uh, algorithms on paper with uh, Hindu Arabic numerals. Eventually, of course, Hindu Arabic numerals won out, and uh, Libra Baki was a major, major work for uh, making that happen. In it, he starts out by talking about the Hindu Arabic numerals, how they work, and showing how to do computations with them, and then he moves on to solving problems, uh, a bunch of different kinds of problems. He does, deals with perfect numbers. He does some Chinese remainder theorem type problems talks about summing arithmetic and geometric series. And there's one particular problem that's probably the most famous one and probably most associated with his name. Here's the problem. A certain man put a pair of rabbits in a place surrounded on all sides by a wall. How many pairs of rabbits can be produced from that pair in a year if it is supposed that every month each pair begets a new pair from which the second month on becomes productive? And it turns out that this is related to a sequence that is now known as the Fibonacci sequence. If you seed it with one and one, and you add one and one together, you get two. Add one and two together, you get three. Add two and three together, you get five. Add three and five together, and go on. So starting with this two, that's your original pair of rabbits, and they produce a child at three, and then 
uh, and then so on, and they just keep reproducing like that. And so this works it works out. It's related to this spiral here. It shows up in nature. You can see this. Uh, there's the the Fibonacci uh, series on a, an Italian stamp with a uh, a picture of Fibonacci on there as well. It turns out that the limit of this sequence uh, is the golden ratio, which is kind of crazy. That's that comes in a lot of interesting places. So there's actually it turns out there's a lot of really cool properties just of the Fibonacci uh, sequence. And like I said, that's probably what he's most famed. Well, he's that's today when you say Fibonacci, this is probably the first thing you think of is this Fibonacci sequence. But he's probably more important for this uh, transmission of the Hindu Arabic numeral system. So looking at his other books that we have in, in uh, still available. Practica Geometry, The Practice of Geometry. It's a geometry problems in eight chapters. They're based on Euclid's elements and on divisions, two of Euclid's books. They had proofs, and then they also had practical problems using those geometric results. In the book Floss, among other things, he is asked to solve a particular equation that in our modern notation we'd write as 10x plus 2x squared plus x cubed equals 20. So he had become a, enough of a uh, famous mathematician that someone sent him a challenge to solve this. Actually, uh, I think this shows up in Al Khwarizmi's work where he does a solution based on a construction using conic sections. And uh, Fibonacci proved that the solution was not a rational answer, nor did it uh, have a, was a square root of a rational number. And so he, uh, he tried to do an approximation technique since he had no way of solving it exactly. And so he ended up approximating the solution to nine decimal places, which is quite a calculation feat. In the Libra uh, Quadratorum, which means the book of squares, it's actually a number theory book. And this one actually is considered his, actually his best work, even though it's not as famous is Libra Baki, the book of calculation. It is the most significant com contribution to number theory between Diophantus in the third century, century and Fermat in the 17th century. So this is a, a major step forward in number theory. He talks about a lot of different things in there, including Pythagorean triples, square numbers, and many more things. So Fibonacci was really the greatest, uh, certainly greatest European mathematician of the Middle Ages, and actually probably the most talented mathematician of his particular lifetime.